It's late, so let's start with the first lecture of Ricardo Mateus. He is a professor here at the IFT and our dear vice director. But that doesn't mean that you have not, you, you cannot make questions. You must make lots of questions. And he's a good teacher. Okay, Ricardo, please start. Thank you, Gaston. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. I'm first day here because I was in vacation until yesterday. So yeah, I take vacations proudly. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invita invitation. I was an organizer of journeys a while ago, and it's nice to see how it is uh, going. Okay. So what I'm talking to you uh, in, the fall, in the next week is about the standard model. Right. This is a bit uh, arrogant on the part of particle physicists, because it's not the standard model of everything. Right? It's the standard model of particle physics. And my, my original idea for the course was to talk about the standard model and then explore in detail a few problems of the standard model. Now I don't know if I'll have the time to do all of that, right? So I, I, I prefer to go slowly so everyone can come with me along the way, right? So mostly, I think, on the three first lectures, I'll be talking about doing like a crash course on the standard model. Right? The standard model is built on top of a few things. Right? There's, there's essentially three main uh, ingredients right, that go into the standard model. One of them is, of course, quantum field theory, which is this very complicated uh, theory that arises when you try to combine quantum mechanics, and uh, special relativity. Right? That's the uh, quantization of special relativity. Right? So you, you have systems that are consistent with these two big, important uh, achievements of the early uh, 20th century. Right? Of course, we cannot cover this uh, fully here in four lectures. Right, this is a whole course. Right? Quantum field theory is usually a one-year course split into two parts, right? one semester long. And uh, you can see my course on quantum field theory on YouTube. Of course, you won't be able to watch it during this week, but uh, the links are there. Right? This is like the first playlist is like 50 hours, and the second playlist is another 60 hours of videos. Right? But there are a few that uh, might be interesting to, to see this week. Right? I, I gave the links. I think they put on the, the website already. Right? So the very first one on, on quantum field theory 1 gives you a, a summary of, or, on why relativistic quantum mechanics fails. It's a different thing than quantum field theory. Still trying to, to, to make a, a mechanical theory, which is relativ relativistic, and that fails. Right, so the very first video tells you why. That's interesting. And there's another video that I put a, a link. It, it belongs to the quantum field theory 2 list, uh, playlist, but which gives a very quick and, 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 and superficial summary of Lie algebras, right, and group theory, the very basics of Lie algebra. And there will be a lot of that showing up when I start talking about symmetries here. Right? So that video could be useful for you, too, if you want to have a very quick summary of Lie algebras. Right? So as I said, you have three ingredients, quantum field theory. Right? And then, of course, as I, I was already almost saying here, you need symmetries. In spe specifically, gauge symmetries will be very important. Right? And, and then finally, the breaking of the symmetries, especially when they happen spontaneously. 
So spontaneous symmetry break. Which we write like that, SSB. Right? So with these three ingredients, right, I can write a model for a particle uh, physics system, right? Once I decide which symmetries my, my uh, model satisfy, and that the, in this decision is also uh, um, implied that I'm deciding on the degrees of freedom of the system, which I'll talk a little bit uh, soon, right? And how these symmetries are broken, if they are broken spontaneously, right? That fixes for me a model. And then this model, I can plug in quantum field theory and make predictions, right? Co calculate cross-sections, probabilities of quantum transitions, essentially, right? And that's, that's the, the game we play, making it very simple in, in particle physics, right? You, you come up with models, you plug them into quantum field theory, you compare that with experiments. Right? And then you decide if the model was good or not. Right? About the mother, the, the degree, degrees of freedom thing that I said, you have to also decide not only uh, which symmetries your system is satisfying, but also what is the matter content. I, am I talking about electrons and protons, or am I talking about quarks or neutrinos? Right? What, what I'm, am I putting in? in terms of particles, which particles I'm trying to describe. Of course, in different energies, you're usually trying to describe different particles. Well, if you go to the most fundamental thing where you have to describe everything, you, 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 you have to decide which are the, the fundamental particles. Right? For, for instance, the proton, we know it's made of quarks. And so I can at least bring of a theory where I can only talk about the quarks and forget the proton because it will be contained there as the bound state. Okay? So I have to decide on this matter content. And that's very phenomenological, right? I just really depends, right? Am I putting, so it, this is where I will decide if I have leptons, if I have quarks, right? gauge bosons, which uh, gauge bosons I have, right, spin one, particles, are they massive, are they not massive? You know, this comes, uh, everything here comes from the experiment. In the case of the standard model, this is basically it, right? This is, uh, our players will be leptons, quarks, gauge bosons, and, and the Higgs boson, right? And then the symmetry, right? In the case of the standard model, is this one. Color, SU3 color, SU2 left times U1 hypercharge. And these are uh, Lie groups. Right? That's why I, I, I told you, knowing at least a little bit about Lie algebras will make your trip easier. Right? And there's also a breaking implying here this breaks down to U1 electromagnetic. So uh, Maxwell equations will come out of this part after the breaking. Okay? So we'll see a little bit about that. The important point is that once you decide, I forgot an R here. Once you decide the matter content of your theory and the symmetries, right? You have to decide how these guys transform under these symmetries, and that fixes uniquely, right, for you, something we call a Lagrangian density. I will explain what that is a little, in a little bit, right, I also talk about, uh, I, I'm just giving an initial summary. Then we'll go through this uh, process in more detail, right? So, but that fixes for you this Lagrangian density which then I can plug in QFT, right? QFT gives me, at this point, this Lagrangian is essentially a classical theory, 
the classical field theory, just have the fields there, right? But Q QFT tells me how to quantize this thing and, and get predictions, right? Get cross sections, uh, bound states, you, you, and a lot, of, a lot of other things, right? Which we will not go into detail, right? It would take too long to actually. So we'll focus in this uh, course more on this step, right? I want to show you what are the ingredients that go into building the standard model Lagrangian, right? Why it is the way it is, right? And a little bit of the phenomenology. There are some things, some predictions of these theories that you can read straight out of the Lagrangian, the classical Lagrangian, right? So this with who, uh, which particles decay into which particles. You can see that on the Lagrangian. What are the masses, right? Who has masses? Uh, w how many massless and how many massive particles there are? That you can read from the Lagrangian, mostly. Right? So there are a few things that you can just look here and already get a feeling for what the theory is, right? There's a, these are a bit of qualitative predictions, but still good enough to get a feeling for the model and understand the problems. That's the point. I may be able, if we go, depending on the speed we go, we, we may be able to talk about neutrino masses at the end, right? which is one of the problems that is not solved in this problem, in this, in this standard model. Right? So, so far, so good. Let me talk, uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the quantum field theory. So the first thing you could ask is why field, right? We're trying to describe particles, right? We're trying to des describe these small little, you can call them billiard ball balls, right? You, you, you know they're quantum billiard balls, but we still use to describe a electron in this way, right? It's just a point-like thing that behaves as like a wave particle, and that's good, right? That's quantum mechanics. Why not use that here, some relativistic version of that here? Right? And the main point is that when you try to do that, people try to do that, right? You can take just the relativistic dispersion relation, right? You can take this equation, right? And here, C is one, A H bar is one, natural units, right? I, if I try to put C everywhere, I'll make mistakes. I'm too used to this, right? But you can take this one, right? And then sub substitute P and E by derivatives in position and derivatives in, in time, right? like you do to get the Schrodinger equation. Apply that to a wave function. Well, there, I quantized a relativistic theory, right? You could, in principle, do that. In fact, Schrodinger, apparently, that's the first thing he tried. He, d he did, go, did this first, and then we realized it was not causal. It had problems defining uh, probabilities. You could get negative probabilities out of there, right? And then he decided, no, oh, no, this makes no sense, and made the Schrodinger equation. He took the non-relativistic limit and quantized that, right? So that does not work. And, and the, the main reason behind it, of course, I will not prove that. I prove that it, it is not causal, and I show this problem with probabilities in the first video in Quantum Field Theory 1. You can see that there. But it's one hour and a half calculations. I won't do it here. Right? Uh, but the main point this fails right, is that when you're talking about wave function of a system, Let's start with a one-particle system, right? It's implied that as this wave function evolves through time, right, there is still one particle. The probability of finding that particle anywhere must be 100%. It does not disappear, right? So otherwise, the probability would be less than 100%. And no new particles appear. Otherwise, the probability could be 200%, right? You can find it in two places now. And that is broken by relativistic theories. We know that at high energies, you can actually produce pairs of particles. You can disappear with particles. This is, from the start, 
already uh, ingrained in, in electromagnetism, right? We know that it makes no sense to say, well, I put 10 photons in a box, and there will be 10 photons in a box uh, arbitrarily large time later. That will thermalize, will become like more like a black body radiation distribution of photons in there. Right? They will be absorbed, re-emitted, right? because the, these theories is intrinsically rel relativistic. There's no non-relativistic limit for photons, right? So the main reason quantum relativistic quantum mechanics fails is because you need a theory where the number of particles is another observable that is not necessarily commuting, right? The operator number of particles is not necessarily commuting with the Hamiltonian. You can create and annihilate particles. You could have states of uh, mixed states of two particles with three particles with four particles. That's a valid state for these theories, right? Where the number of particles is not even uh, uh, well determined for the system, right? And that's what quantum field theory does, right? And and you you see people got to that idea from many different directions, right? On one side, people were trying to quantize the the electric and the magnetic field. In that way, it was very obvious that you had to start with a classical field theory, not a classical mechanical theory, right? But from the side where you come in, you were trying to get relativistic theory for the electron, that was not so obvious. That you, in fact, had to think of the electron like you did with the photon, where you have a field everywhere, electric or magnetic, right? And the intensity of that field is roughly proportional to the number of photons there. Right? So the idea that you could do the same for the electron, so you have an electron field everywhere, and the, the, the more intense that field is, the higher the probability of measuring many electrons and positrons, right, the antiparticle of the electron in that region is. Uh, that is only something that makes sense in the very high energy limit, in the ultra relativistic limit, right? We can create and annihilate electrons like they are massless. Yeah, exactly. So the eigenstates of number of particles. Uh, will have an uncertainty in energy. And, but the, the better way of thinking about that is that if you start with a state with two particles and you evolve it in time, right? The evolution is time, in time is given by the Hamiltonian. If that does not commute with the Hamiltonian, then it's not a stationary state. That means that the number of uh, particles can change through time evolution, right? And that's the main point. Right? You can create and, and I annihilate these particles. Right? So then, inspired by this analogy with uh, uh, electromagnetism, right? the quantization of electromagnetism, we will quantize a field theory. We will start with a classical field theory and quantize that. Right? And the way to understand how we quantize that theory can be done in analogy of, uh, with what we do in quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, let me put, put here mechanics. So this is classical mechanics. This is quantum mechanics. And how we, do we go from one to the other, right? We do a process we call quantization. Right? which is basically an educated guess, right? Uh, it's, it's a guess because these theories should not contain the information of what happens here. This is more general, right? These theories do not contain quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics contains that one, and not the other way around. Right? So trying to guess the more general theory is starting from the particular theory. Hmm? And the only thing you, you, our usual processes of, uh, of quantization guarantee is coming back. So this guess is educated because it guarantees that in the classical limit, you go back to the theory you started with. 
Right? That's the whole point of this gate. Right? So the way we do that, right? In, in classical mechanics, you have some set of coordinates and conjugate momenta, right? And you want to exchange that by operators. Right? So you have now these uh, coordinates. If you, if, if you want to keep it simple, this is po just position, right? Could be one, two, three in three dimensions, right? And momenta, but it could be more general than that. Right? And then you get these operators now. And the way you go from one to the other is by exchanging a, a very important piece of information here, which are the Poisson brackets of this theory. Right? You can define this thing called a Poisson bracket. Let me indicate like that so you don't get confused with anti-commutator that will show up later. Right? And this is true for uh, conjugate coordinates and, and momenta. The Poisson bracket is defined like that. Let me put in the corner here. So for any two functions of the, the coordinates and momenta, you can get the Poisson bracket by summing over all the coordinates this thing here, partial derivatives in QI. Pi minus the other way around. And the reason this, this, these brackets are important is because they fix the equations of motion in the Hamiltonian approach, right? So you can write the equations of the motion for the classical system like that. So q dot is the derivative in time, right? And which in this particular case is just, and you have also an equation for p dot. which is also the Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. So you see, like in the quantum mechanical system, the evolution in time is, is fixed by the Hamiltonian, right? And you solve these equations you have solved for the system. You know everything that can be known, right? We need some initial conditions, and that's it. Right? Quantizing, in this case, is nothing, right? So I'll put it over here. The quantization process is nothing but exchanging these Poisson brackets by commutators. So you make this substitution there, and for once I'll put the h bar here. Later I'll forget it and say it's one by commutators. When you do that, you get quantum mechanics, right? If I do that here, I get this equation. We have a minus i over h bar on the left side. I, I throw that to the right side. I'll get this one. For now, I'm keeping the h bar just to help you. It goes away soon, right? Which is a well known thing, right? And the same for the equations of motion, right? I'll get. in terms of the operators now, right? Now everything is written in terms of operators on this side. Maybe there's a wrong sign here, but maybe not. We'll check later. Right? And that's it. That's what I call quantizing, right? And that procedure is easy, is easy to generalize to a field, right? Because I can write a field like a big, big set of coordinates. Right? Let me show you how. So is, is anything confusing to, up to this point? You might have seen this before or not, depending on how you 
Well, that's really just a definition. You just take any two functions. These are any, any two functions in your theory. They are always, fun they will, the most general thing they can be is a function of all the coordinates and all the conjugate momenta, right? And you just make the derivative in, in the coordinate momenta, and, and this is the other way around. F is derived in momenta and G in, in position, right? The, the important thing is that this one, right? If you take put F equal to P there and G equal to Q, you get this delta. You just make the derivatives and you see, right? And these two are very important too, right? Because they give you the equations of motion. Right? So, any, any other questions at this point? Okay, so now what we want to do is to use this to quantize a field, which is a more complicated object, right? A field is this, this thing that mathematically it assigns to every position in, in, in space-time, right? A number or even more than one number, if it is a vector field. Say, the, the, you could think of the field of, of temperatures in this room, right? For every point in space. 3D space, here is assigning a temperature, just one number. Right? But you could also think of the field of velocities of air, flow of air here. That one for each point in space, we will assign a vector for the direction the air is flowing in each point. Right? Fields can be as complicated as you want. I could make a field which the very first compa component is the temperature, and the other three are the, the, the velocities. And I could put even as a fifth component the density of the air, right? And then get an equation for this very complicated field would set all, the, all the, the behavior of the air inside the room completely, right? So I want to quantize that object now, right? And since I'm, 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 I'm telling you that for each point in space is assigning a number, and space is, as far as we know, a continuous thing, right? It has potentially infinite number of coordinates to be described, right? I, had, I need an infinite number, a number of numbers to this, describe this fully, right? But what, what I can do is a little trick, right, which is make small boxes, right? So I can take, for instance, let's think in 3D space because I'm very bad at drawing four, in 4D. And you could, you could just take boxes here, right? Take small volumes. Right? And then order them in some way. Just assign an index, right? That runs all over this 3D space, but I can do that with just one index. Just choose a direction, right? <laughs> and, and I can just call this guy QY of T. It's the value of the field in that position. I'm assuming now, just for simplicity, a field like the temperature field, right? A field that is just one number. If I needed more, I could do more. It's the same, right? But let's assume it's just one number, right? And this is q y plus one, and it's it's changing in time, right? And I can do that for the whole space, right? When I do I'm, when I'm doing that, I'm discretizing my field, right? I'm turning something that was continuous into a discrete thing over these boxes. And I can always go back by taking the limit where the box gets smaller and smaller, right? Keeping the total volume fixed, right? which is also infinite, right? So I'll get cancellation between these two infinities and everything should be okay, right? So then if I do that, I'm exchanging this uh, scalar field, so that's the symbol I'll use when the field is just a number, not a vector, not more complicated thing. Right? That is something that depends on all positions and on time, and I'm exchanging this by this huge set of coordinates, right? o, which is the value of the field in each of these positions. Right? So I'll say that this set, qi of t, right, is the same as phi i, and i is the same index here and here. right? And that's equivalent in the continuum limit to this thing. 
right? And this is the discrete limit. And hopefully, I can go from one to the other without uh, trouble. Right? In practice, it, it can be complicated to do that, especially with spin half particles. But we will not deal into these problems, right? The people found ways of doing it consistently, right? No, the reason I'm going to the discrete version is because then I can use this prescription for quantization, right? Which is called the qu canonical quantization, right? I could stay in the continuum limit, but then quantizing the theory would demand a little more groundwork, right? You can quantize this thing straight in the continuum limit by doing path integrals. If you know what that is. Fine, but I hope, I, I, I expect not even 5% of you to know it, right? There are quantization procedures that you could use straight out on this side, right? But that's just simpler, right? And, 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 and I'll go back, and, and in the end, we'll stay with the continuous theory, right? And we'll be discretizing in other ways, but not space-time. That's also very useful if you want to use these theories in a computer, right? If you ever heard of lattice field theory, that's essentially what you do. You work on this side, right? And take the continuum limit numerically at the end. Right? But that, that, that's beside the point. The only reason I'm, I'm doing this now is because I want to use this quantization. And to use this, I need some discrete index to, to to plug here and, and replace by commutator. That's all. Right? That's just a trick, because I'm trying to quantize this thing in ways using what you already know from undergrad courses. Right? OK. And I, I need to do the same for the conjugate momenta. Right? So also on this side, I have some pi of t. Right? I'll, I'll have to define conjugate momenta to this field. It's not easy at this moment to, to, to know what these guys are. I'll just give them a name for now. And later, I'll give a, a more concrete definition of them. Right? So I'll, I'll call this pi, the conjugate field to that one. And of course, on, in the continuum limit, this guy becomes a, f a function of position and time. And then if I want to quantize this, I will impose, I will take these uh, Poisson brackets and replace by commutators right here. So these two guys become operators, right? So I'll get something like this, right? And now I'm, as promised, I'm forgetting h bar, going back to natural units, right? And that's the commutation relation in the discrete version, right? Now, if I want to take this to the continuum, I have to be careful of defining these objects with some uh, uh, dependence on the volume of these boxes and the volume of the whole uh, space, right? So just to take the continuum limit, uh, uh, the continuum limit properly. I won't do it in detail, but I, I think you can believe me that will, this will become something like this. So this is x. Uh, let me get more space. Otherwise, the more, most important thing will be too small for you to see. I'll, I'm going to this side, but that's the continuum limit. So this will become. So here, notice I'm comparing i and j are the indexes that are running over space, right? So i different from j means two different positions there in the limit, 
right? So pi will be a function of some x prime, right? But the time was the same for both. So this is known as the equal time commutation relation, and these will be just De a direct delta, right? X minus X prime, right? I delete everything here, because that's the thing we want, right? So this is the continuum limit of this idea. Right? See, instead of a Kronecker delta, now I get a direct delta, and the normalizations were all hidden in the process here, right? I could make these guys not exactly equal to the field, but the field over a volume or something, whatever I needed in the end to get this, because that's the simplest version of the thing, right? So now you see the field itself is becoming an operator, right? And, and, and that's a very important thing, right? Because if you think a little bit of what was happening in quantum mechanics, right, you were turning position and momenta into operators. But these two guys were dependent on time, which is an index, right? You just run that, that parameter, right? You, it's a parameter that you run. As you move that parameter, these operators change. Okay? There was no time operator at all. And that's the first sign you could use to guess that this is not a very good candidate for a relativistic theory, right? Time and space are being treated very differently here, right? Position is an observable. Time is just a parameter that you change in these theories, right? People were trying to get this guy, and that failed badly, right? What we did is the opposite. Now, position is not an observable. It makes no sense to ask what's the position of a field. It's everywhere, right? Position is just another index now. Now I'm running position and time. There's these four parameters, right, here. There are four parameters here, four parameters there, right? And as I run these parameters, these operators change, right? And then I, I can ask myself about the expected value of this operator at a position or at a certain time. but Time and position themselves are not observable, right? So that's a much better candidate for a relativistic theory from the start, right? And you're only quantizing it once. I, I want to, you to keep that in mind because especially if you get somewhat older uh, uh, quantum field theory books, you hear a lot about second quantization, right? Like you're quantizing the theory one, you get a, f a wave function, and then you quantize the wave function. Right? Like you're quantizing twice. That makes very little sense. That's what happened historically. Right? But notice, I'm getting to the same thing here, quantizing only once, but I'm starting from a field. So really what people were calling second quantization, they were looking at that wave function they obtained from the first quantization as a classical field, and then you're quantizing that classical field. But that first step where you're quantizing a um, mechanical system to get the wave function, the classical field, is not necessary. I can start straight from classical field and just use the symmetries of these fields to fix my model and then quantize that once, right? So really, quantum field theory is about the quantization of this field, right? Keep that in mind. And then there's no second quantization, logically speaking, right? Only historically speaking, there was a second quantization, right? So then we can start to get towards this object, which is a very important one, right? Mostly we work in the Lagrangian formalism instead of the Hamiltonian one, although we can go back and forth if we really need to, right? But uh, the main object for us is the action, right? Which in classical mechanics, right? It's just the integral in time of the Lagrangian. And then you can get, on this point of view, instead of the Hamilton equation, right? you can use the principle of extreme action here to get the Euler-Lagrange equation. 
which is equivalent, right? And now, this Lagrangian will have to be written in terms of this infinite number of degrees of freedom, right? I have an infinite number of Qs and an infinite number of Ps here, one for each point in space, right? In, in when we want to do that, we make an extra assumption, right? This is an assumption, very important one, but it particularizes our theories, which is the assumption that this system is a local system, right? Which means I can rewrite this as also an integral in space and something that we call I don't have another color, a Lagrangian density, which depends on the field and derivatives of the field locally. So this is a function of x, and this is a function of x, right? The assumption here is that in that Lagrangian, there is no term that involves knowing the field at distant points, right? Which in general could be true. But since we're talking about a relativistic theory, right, that distance should be constrained by causality, right? And so what I'm assuming here is that I only need to know the field at points and, and derivatives on that point, right? And, and so this theory is local. And there will be a lot of consequences for local field theories. Some people stu study non-locality in quantum field theory, how that changes the game. But the standard model, as far as we know, is a local theory, right? So we can write this Lagrangian density, and that fixes the whole story. Then it becomes complicated. What will happen on this side is that you get the propagators of the theory. Right? You get the Feynman propagator, retarded, advanced propagators. It's very similar to what you might have seen in electromagnetism with these retarded and, and uh, potentials, right? So different time commutators will carry with them the concept of, of causality. Right? So things that are outside the, the, the causal past and future of each other should commute. but not inside this, this light cone, right? So now I will worry only about the construction of this Lagrangian density. Since we'll never talk about the Lagrangian anymore, everybody just called this the Lagrangian, but it's important to keep in mind is a density of Lagrangian. You have to integrate in space to get the right thing. And now in, with this in hand, I can properly define that conjugate field, right, pi of x and t will be just what you expect it to be in the analogy with classical mechanics, right? That's the conjugate momenta, right? But now I'm, I'm differentiate, differentiating it in the field. And I can also go to the Hamiltonian approach, right? I can write a Hamiltonian. Since I'm assuming my theory is local, Right? I can also write this guy in terms of uh, space integral of densities, right? So this is just the usual thing you use to go from Hamiltonians to Lagrangians, but written in terms of these densities. Let me make these a little bit smaller. just transformation of variables, right? You're exchanging phi dot for pi, right? And that I can define this object here. We also call it a Hamiltonian density. It's the same idea. It depends on phi and pi, right? And then I close my loop here. I have every description, right? We usually will work on the Lagrangian approach. And as I said, still speaking of uh, classical field theories, right? you can get equations of motion from there. Right? There are Hamiltonian equations of motion are these, right? 
And the Lagrangian ones will be given by Euler-Lagrange equation, which is just extremizing the action, right? And now I'm using already a, a notation, right, that uh, this is summed over, and this index goes from 0 to 3, 0 being time. And in my convention, the, the metric is the right one. I already started writing it wrong. It's this one, right, and everything else is 0. Yeah. And this is Euler-Lagrange equation. Right, so far so good. We have, a, I hope, convinced you uh, uh, that we can have this classical field theory and we know how to quantize it, right? I won't go into the details of the consequences of this, right? Only when I need it, right? You, have a, you need a whole course for that. The links are over there, right? Any, anything you want to ask at this point? Because now I'll start to talk about the symmetries, right? Will you use symmetries to define what I put here? This is the input of my theory, right? That's where my model goes. Anything? It's the in particle physics is the dominating one, yeah. This the well for for the metric, yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's basically the, the dominating one for particle physics, and and the other one, right, is for for people doing gravity and strings. And sensible yeah, sensible people use this one. That's why I said that that's the right one. There's the wrong one, but some people use it anyway. Okay, okay, so let's go to building Lagrangians now, right? We want to, to spend most of our time worrying about what goes in that Lagrangian density because then everything else is a consequence. So I said that what we'll fix, let me put a title here just to be organized. So as I said before, the main thing we use to uh, decide on which Lagrangian to use, right, is really the degrees of freedom of my theory right, and symmetries. These, these fields are uh, transforming under, right? And uh, of course, I've been saying from the start, right? I want a relativistic theory, a relativistic theory. So the main symmetry, right? Should, should be symmetry under Lorentz uh, transformation, right? Even more general under, under Poincaré transformations. These, these two transformations, they form groups, right? There's a group. The Poincaré group, there's the Lorentz group, for those of you that know group theory, right? And if I want my Lagrangian to be symmetric under Lorentz transformation, right, the sensible thing to do is to decide on fields that transform under a specific representation of the Lorentz group. Right? For those of you that don't know uh, group theory, that, can be, that statement can be made simpler, right? I want fields that I know how they transform if I do a Lorentz transformation, right? It, it makes no sense for me to decide on fields that are complicated, that have very complicated Lorentz transformations or, or transformations that I, that I don't even know, right? So the, the first thing we'll do is to classify fields according to how they transform under Lorentz transformation. So the simplest thing I could write, right? So just to define the notation. Now I'm wondering about what happens if my space-time coordinates, they get transformed in this way, 
Now this transformation is a Lawrence transformation. This guy goes into some X primes. Let me put the same I put in here. Okay. All right, this is summed over, and this is the Lorentz transformation, right? It's a combination of rotations in 3D, 3D and boosts, which are, which are rotation in the position time plane, right? What happens to the fields, right? And there are many things that could happen. Depends on the field, on the properties of the field. The simplest thing I could write, right, is a Lorentz scalar. A field, now x without the, the vector symbol on top means four-dimensional x, right? It's space-time. The simplest thing that could happen is that this guy goes into phi prime, x prime, both the position, so I'm worried here, both on the transformation of the coordinates themselves and the functional form of the field, right? That function could change. And the simplest thing is not to change at all. This is what we call a scalar field. Right? You know scalar quantities in, I don't know, the rest mass of particles is Lorentz scalar. Right? So I could, in principle, have scalar fields. Right? The next, so this, these guys we call scalar fields. Now the next, next thing is much more complicated. right? is what we call a spinor field. And this guy transforms as a very complicated function of the Lorentz transformation that is here, right? This guy will become a function that is given by this representation of the Lorentz group, right? And this now has a very uh, involved definition. It's not easy to see that this is a Lorentz transformation. But the thing is, if you write this guy explicitly, this one, this is just any parameter, right? And depends on lambda, on, on the parameters of this transformation. And this is a matrix, and this matrix is defined in terms of the famous Dirac matrices. It is possible, I won't do it here, to show that these operators satisfy all the same um, relations, the algebra of the group, as these guys satisfy. Right? So you can build an algebra for this group, and these guys satisfy it. And that means that this is another representation of Lorentz transformation. It's a very complicated one. Right? But the point why I need this is that we'll see later. Right? This, so far, I'm talking about the classical fields. Once I quantize these fields, particles will emerge. Right? I'll have a particle interpretation for the, quanta the quantum version of this theory. And this will give me spin zero particles, right? but this one will give me the fermions, and specifically the spin half fermions. I won't prove it here. Right? But you see that when I'm trying to classify fields in terms of representations of the Lorentz group, I'm also getting uh, all the different spins, right? The next one is easier than this one. Let me just write a few properties for this one, w one of each, one of which I want you to prove, actually, as an exercise. Oh. Yeah. So... The main property that is important for us the, of this, this uh, matrix, right, is this one. So independently of which Lorentz transformation I put in here, this is true.
And the reason this is important is that the, the, the Dirac matrices are transforming under the action of these two matrices from the left and the right, as you would expect for a Lorentz vector. Right? And that has an important consequence, which is that this derivative, when I take the derivative of this fermionic field, this is spinner, right? and I contract it with a Dirac matrix, Dirac matrix right? and do the Lorentz transformation, this thing here. Now I have a transformation for the coordinates here. I have a transformation for the field here. I also have a, a transformation for the coordinates inside the field. Right? But this turns out to be, because of this property, this turns out to be co a covariant derivative, right? this contraction. Right? So this object is transforming exactly like the field does, you see, with MD in front. And that's very important for us because that's the derivative then that we have to use in the Lagrangian if we want to build invariants, right? I can contract with the field from the left. And I want to, as an exercise, so this is exercise one, I want you to prove this, right? I, I think everything you need is on the blackboard. If not, maybe you have to look a little bit on the properties of Dirac matrices. Wikipedia level, you, you can do it, right? And then there's a, still another representation that will be very important for us, which is, of course, vectors, right? I could have a field, and the symbol I use for the field is very suggestive, right? I could have a field that has a Lorentz index explicitly, Right? And that guy, under the representation, under the uh, Lorentz transformation, will go just like a vector. So we're going to A prime, mu x prime, right? which is just mu nu A nu of x. And it turns out that if I quantize these things, I get spin one particle. And that's all I care about because gravity does not exist in particle physics, right? And, and, and it's too dangerous to put gravity in here for many reasons. So I don't need spin two particles, right? Which would arise from a tensor field, right? So using these three fields, I can build three kinds of fields, right? We know there's more than one spin half particle. There's more than one vector field, right? There are many of them, and I'll have to combine. But these three kinds of uh, particles allow me, uh, fields for now, allow me to write very easily uh, Lorentz invariant Lagrangians, because I know exactly how they transform. I just have to combine them to make Lorentz uh, scalars. Out of these, out of these combinations, right? So, just to give a few examples, <laughs> so this, a scalar to any power is a Lorentz invariant because it does not transform, right? If I contract vector fields like that, that also gives me a Lorentz invariant, right? This one will transform from the left, from the right. Those matrices will disappear in the middle, right? Less trivial ones, this one, right? Where this guy, psi bar, is defined as psi dagger gamma zero. This is important, right? Because this guy is now a complex field. I didn't show that yet, but this guy is a complex field. It has more than one component. That you can see from here because these are four by four matrices, right? So this guy is a four component thing, right? Just like this one is a four component thing, 
but this, these components transform in a different way than those, right? And, and so this is the guy that under Lorentz transformation, it goes into then this m minus 1 will conceal with this m and give me a Lorentz invariant. Right? Your first guess would be to just use psi dagger or psi transpose, but that does not work. Right? That you can show, too, using the properties. Another one is this one. More complicated one. Right? But this thing you can show pretty easily, transform like a Lorentz vector, so I can contract it with another Lorentz vector to get invariance. Right? And so on, right? Most famously, there's this one where f mu nu is, is del mu a nu minus del mu a nu, right? And, and that will give us the, all the Maxwell equations if you apply uh, Euler-Lagrange equations here, right? So that's it for today. Uh, any, any, we have time for questions. Yeah. Or, or talk about the next page, so I have time. <laughs> yeah. It's a parameter, right? You have to figure out the way to, to get this function, right, is to, this you know completely, right? Once you define what a Dirac matrix is, right? There's a algebra, this, this, these matrices satisfy, right? So you know this part. Now to fix these functions, what you have to do is to plug in this guy and demand that the total thing satisfy the algebra of a Lorentz group. Then you fix this function, right? There will be a function of the boost. So they are carrying the information of the boost, how, how boosted it is, are you doing just a rotation or a rotation plus a boost, you know? So this will be all in this parameter, right? And you can take it to be infinitesimal because the, the Lorentz group is a Lie group, right? You can, I mean, the, the proper Lorentz group is a Lie group. There's also a discrete part of the group. But. Oh, I, I wouldn't be able to write it explicitly, but uh, I don't see why boost, uh, rotations and, and boosts would be different, right? In fact, the rotations here are quite tricky. That's one of the parts that change, right? What you see here is that once you rotate a uh, 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 spin half thing by 2 pi, it ends up with a sign, and then you have to rotate again. And that is, is, is contained here, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, in, in the proper place. Well, it's it's similar, but instead of using sines and cosines, right? If you go for not for an infinitesimal one, right? You in, in the rotation part here, you have take any plane, right? The rotation will be sines and cosines, right? It'll be a two by two sub matrix of sines and cosines. The boost is hyperbolic sines and hyperbolic cosines. You can think of it of as a hyperbolic rotation, right? So that's the kind of thing that will show up here. Uh, but I, 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 I wouldn't try to write it. I would just mess everything if I try to write it right now. Right? So, but, but that's essentially the same, but with hyperbolic. Uh, uh, there's one up there. This one? Ooh. Oh, gamma. Oh, that depends on the representation. You have some freedom to choose that, right? Uh, let me see. Yeah, you can. Yeah, there's. You have some freedom of choice, right? So there's one. 
Let me see if I can get it right. Hmm? Yeah, the gamma zero is just one, right? This is a four by four matrix, right? So there's a representation where this is just the identity, something like that, right? And gamma i will be Pauli matrices. Uh, now I might get the sign wrong here, but uh, it's something like that. Then this is a four by four zero, four, uh, two by two zero, two by two zero, Pauli matrix, Pauli matrix, and those are, so that's one representation, right? So what you need these guys to satisfy is That's the definition, right? And, 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 and that gives, gives you a lot of freedom of how you, you choose these guys. Mostly I'll use one where gamma 5 is this, which is called the Cairo representation. And then the gamma 0 is different, right? But uh, there's more than one way of building these guys. Oh, sidebar, let me write it again. Is this matrix, right? So I just take the dagger and then contract with comma zero from the right. But all that is also dependent on the choice for this metric. You see, if I change the signs of the metric, that changes the definition of the gamma matrices, right? And that changes what I put here. So some people use it like that to compensate for the sign here. You have to be very careful with this, right? Because you're, we're always choosing specific representations. So I, I'll, I'll be consistent with that metric I choose and what is called the chiral representation for the, the Dirac matrices, which is not this one. It's one where gamma 5 is diagonal, which is a fifth matrix that I can define that anti commutes with all the others. Right? That will be important for us because we'll be worried about parity a lot right, in the standard model. So we'll need to, to use that a lot. But these ones I will not, not use at all, right? Not the specific forms, because you can contain yourself just to relate to these, the consequences of these relations. Then you don't have to decide on the specific forms of these guys at all, right? You just use the properties that are satisfied in every representation. So the, these two definitions are not at all important for me. I won't use them at all, I will, but I will use that one a lot. Yeah. A dagger, a dagger. So it's the transpose complex conjugate. Let me make my dagger more clear. Yeah, yeah. So one hidden assumption I'm making here is that I'll be treating renormalizable theories, right? And that limits the number of powers of fields and derivatives that I can have in the Lagrangian, right? And, and, and that uh, constrains the, the operators I'm putting on the Lagrangian. That's a good assumption as far as you're far away from the limits of the validity of the theory, right? So there's this understanding that field theories, just looking at a field theory, even if it goes really well with experiment, right? You're comparing the theory with experiment, it's working like the standard model does, right? In one part to billion, right? Still, you don't know if that's the whole thing. There's no way of telling that from quantum field theory or no, alone. There could be an energy at some point, a high energy, where the theory fails. Right? As long as you go away from that limit, imagine, there's a, we call that the cutoff, right? There's a cutoff for the theory somewhere, some energy where it fails. If you go away from that theory, 
you can show in quantum field theory that all the operators that are non-renormalizable, so contain a lot of derivatives or a lot of powers of the field, they go to zero. They run to zero. That's, that's one of the main consequences of renormalization. So if you're far away from that limit, you don't have to, to write those operators at all because they won't matter. They only start being important as you get close to the limit. Uh, you, you, in, in practice, you don't write those terms in your Lagrangian, but you're always looking for them. Because when they start appearing, it, it means new things are coming. Uh, and, and so we will, all the operators I wrote here, already erased, are all renormalizable, right? with the exception of the phi to the n. In four dimensions, this has to be smaller than four. If I put a five here already, I'm going into non-renormalizable theories. And that phi to the five is a irrelevant operator far away from the cutoff. And the same goes for the derivative. So you can have two derivatives if you take just this term. Remember, this is inside a, a Lagrangian, right? Which is inside an integral. So I can do integration by parts and put two, two derivatives here. Right? That's easy. But if you want to, to go with more derivatives, you already, there's no four derivative uh, 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 operator that is renormalizable. So those won't matter away from the cutoff. Huh? Mm. Well, there's, there's very fundamental ways of seeing that, and there's, there's uh, phenomenological ways, right? So, I think it's easier for you to understand the phenomenological one, because what will happen is when I build Lagrangians out of this uh, field, for instance, and then I go about quantizing it, there's no consistent way of quantizing this theory with commutators, right? So I said quantizing is exchanging these Poisson brackets by commutators, right? If I try to do that for this field, right, it, it won't work. What will happen is that you have a theory that has uh, infinite negative energies, badly defined probabilities, all problems. So you have to exchange that for anti-commutators. Now, this is a Poisson bracket, and this is an anti-commutator. So it turns out that the only way of quantizing this will give me Fermi statistics already. Also, if you take and you define operators here, right, uh, based on conserved quantities, so you say, oh, my theory is invariant under rotations, right? So angular momentum should be conserved. And you look for the operator that is the conserved charge under rotation. And you look at the excitations of this theory, they will ca carry half uh, momentum. They will carry a momentum of one half. So you can show that these are, are respecting Fermi statistics. The spectra is made of excitations which carry spin half every time you increase the number of particles, et cetera, right? Well, it's, it is the sum, right? I already show for instance, in the examples I gave, I had a term like that. This term is, is a term where you have spin half particles interacting with spin one particles. Right? This is how the electron interacts with the photon, by the way. Right? But also, I could write a sum. Right? This is also, if each of these terms is Lorentz invariant, the sum is Lorentz invariant. So my Lagrangian will be a big sum of all of those fields, right? of, of all of these terms. And of course, every time I have a term that mixes two of these, right? in principle, I could write this one. It won't be allowed by different symmetries, but in principle, just thinking of Lorentz, I could write this one. right? 
That means that equations of motion, classically speaking, will be coupled, right? If I use Euler Lagrangian for this field and this one, the, 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 the equations will be coupled. So they are all interacting and doing complicated stuff. In fact, the, the full Lagrangian is quite big. I'll show the full thing at some point, and you'll see it's for the, the standard model, right? It's really big in the number of terms, depending on how you write it, right? But, but if you are going really explicit, it gets huge, right? You decide. <laughs> it's the last, last one. That's one. That those are those are interaction terms. So I'll I'll, I'll, I'll show these more properly, right? But anything that is uh, contain more than two powers of the fields is an interaction. So this is is an interaction between uh, the fermion and a vector, right? This is an interaction between vectors and scalars. Right? These are all interactions. And the way to see at this point is just that if I take classical equations of motion, they will be coupled. So the time evolution of one field is dependent on the evolution of another, right? Oh, you, you would notice if this is in nature, but you haven't noticed this guy, you try to describe this one, you, you fail, right? At some point, it depends on the strength of this interaction, right? There's always a number that I could put in front here, which could be really small, and then your measurements really need to be really precise to notice that interaction. But eventually, if you think on the limit of infinite precision, right, you'll fail. So there could be still hidden fields out there, but they need to couple below a certain intensity with the ones we have already seen for us to have missed them so far, right? Coffee. 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 Thank you.